Thank you all for coming. Uh, the FVS Center, uh, well, by the way, I'm Bob Kirsch. I'm the, I'm the executive director of the FVS Center. And we had a really special year this year. And I'd like to take a little time just to walk through that and, and give you a little bit of an update on the activities of the center and kind of a look forward at where, at where we're headed. I'm going to talk about who we are and what we do. We do more than that. Who we are, we're a consortium. The FVS Center is, receives its core funding from the, the Department of Veterans Affairs Rehabilitation Research and Development Service. That's our home. That's where our offices are. We have a great set of laboratories there. But we also have three other consortium members. The Case Western Reserve University is our technical home. Metro Health Medical Center and University Hospitals are major medical centers here in town. And we collaborate with them extensively on different aspects of the work that I'll present today. So we're, we're a big, happy family. We're also a lot of experts. So we have right now 67 investigators in the FES Center. More than half of those are physicians. They're, they're physician scientists. And slightly less than half are PhDs. We have a large staff that include engineers and therapists and nurses and other uh, personnel that help us do our job. And we have 41 trainees. These are postdoctoral fellows, graduate students, undergraduate students, and they help us build our capacity, our research capacity for the future. We develop technology. We develop a number of different kinds of technology. We do things like models to help us accelerate and improve some of the tech techniques that we use. We develop implanted stimulators and recording devices. We develop electrodes. We put them together into systems that we apply to people. We identify clinical needs. We work with our clinical partners, with, our, with the investigators and with others to identify what the needs are and determine where we can best use electrical stimulation to relieve conditions that people have. So I'll talk more about this later, but there's many conditions that we, that we address in the FES Center. And finally, we, we do clinical deployment. We do work all the way from the most basic research all the way through to deployment in, in relatively large numbers of people to, term, to basically demonstrate the feasibility of the approach. So we're the Functional Electrical Stimulation Center, and I just want to take a second to define that because we, we tinkered with this uh, recently. So we have a very broad definition of electrical stimulation. It's basically using small electrical currents that are applied to the nervous system to change its activation or to reduce its activation. And, but we, we can do that either to direct neurons that innervate organs or we can do that to networks of neurons and do what's called neuromodulation. If we do this correctly, we, functional electrical stimulation then speaks the language of the nervous system and we can intervene in, in appropriate ways. We have a broad range of, of applications of electrical stimulation. Just about every function in your body is controlled or influenced in some way by the nervous system. So we, if we can intervene in the proper way, we can use functional electrical stimulation for many different things. For example, we can restore motor function. That's been our, our sort of bread and butter for many years. We can look at things like pain and other sensory um, uh, functions. Neuromodulation is, is a, a term that's used to describe electrical stimulation in, in some applications. Rehabilitation, improve uh, normal, or I shouldn't say normal, standard rehabilitation techniques through uh, targeted use of electrical stimulation. And we now have the ability not just to activate the nervous system, but also inactivate it when it's, when it's firing inappropriately. So in a nutshell, I won't bore you with details, but our vision is to perform cutting edge research and engineering development that create new, effective, and clinically available options for a wide range of conditions. So this is very broad. Our mission is to basically to use electrical stimulation based interventions to 
um, replace natural uh, neural function and, and then mitigate the, the, f the effects due to, uh, to different diseases and injuries. Our approach of the center, now we have many investigators, they do many different things, but the FVS center is sort of the umbrella under which we all um, operate. And the, the functions of the center are to nurture and focus our unique mix of skills. We have people that are scientists, that are engineers, that are physicians with different expertise. We have different institutions that have different expertise and we, we help nurture this community so that we can move the whole field forward. Oops, I keep forgetting I have this thing. We do this in a number of ways, and again, I'm not gonna go into great detail, but we assist our investigators. We provide resources and services that are, that are cross-institutional, um, are things that are specialized, so they're not typical resources that are provided by our institutional partners. We work to build national, uh, to work on the national strategic uh, view of, of treatment of these disorders. Um, we build industrial partnerships. We help facilitate individual partnerships between people in the Cleveland community. Um, I think I'll leave it at that. But we, like I said, we, we build research capacity. We also try to facilitate the development of technology that's useful by many of us, not, not just a few. And as I'll talk about, we focus now, our research focuses are very broad. We, whoops. We work on movement. We restore movement to people with paralysis. We do a variety of things in brain health, pain, and autonomic systems. And I'll talk more about these in a, in a minute. You can all see your names up there, I hope, or if they're not up there, hopefully they will be. This is just to show that we have many different investigators and they work in many different areas. This was a, a table out of our recent proposal. These are our application areas, the body movements, pain, brain, and autonomic. And these are technologies and tools that we use in this work. So we have a lot of investigators, as I already said. And this is, this is our executive committee. These are uh, a subset of those investigators who work on a, on a daily, weekly, monthly basis to look at strategic planning, to sort of guide the activities of the center, to do budgetary re review, these sorts of things. Um, I think many of these people are here, but as you'll see, um, we have a director. Ron Reekers is our new medical director. We have clinicians from our three main clinical partners and then we have engineers and scientists from across the, the community. I, I showed this briefly before, but I just want to emphasize that the FVS Center does applications throughout the body. And we, we have applications all the way from, you know, restoring limb movement and pain, cough and breathing, um, visceral functions, and, and things in the brain as well. And we'll go into a little more detail in a moment. And again, just to emphasize, we do discovery research, things like modeling to understand the, the neural circuits that underlie some of the disorders in, in the brain, in this case, um, recording from, from the brain, uh, understanding epilepsy, electrical block instead of just activation, uh, pulmonary function, and pain, spinal cord stimulation for pain. These are examples of basic discovery. We also develop technology to then implement these in, 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 in people eventually. So we have implanted devices that I'll talk a little bit about. We have electrodes that stimulate, that we record. We have models of the brain. We have models of the musculature of the arm. We study bladder function. We develop technology, uh, unique technology to do bladder function, sleep apnea in this case. So we have a broad range of, of applications. So I just want to give you some recent highlights uh, of, of activities of the FES Center to kind of set the stage for why I'm pretty uh, bullish on, on the, the, the next few years. 
So the number of investigators in the FES Center went from 28 in 2006 to 49 in 2011, and it's now 68. So there's been a, a, a huge growth and a huge diversity of, of new investigators in the center. We have a new medical director, Ron Reekers, who's the, the chief of the neurology service over at the VA. He is a, a, a very strongly involved in traumatic brain injury treatment and, and is, we're hoping that over the next few years we can build up a major research effort in traumatic brain injury. We have a new director of strategic and industrial collaborations, Andy Cornwell. He reaches out to industry and tries to match us up both in our thought processes, in our expertise with companies big and small, also with other academic groups, other research institutions, other laboratories to try to, to uh, uh, you know, sort of leverage the expertise that they have with the expertise that we have. We have many partners in the work that we do. These are ones that are here in town. The Neural Engineering Center is part of Biomedical Engineering, led by Dominic Duran. Advanced Platform Technology Center is a sister center from the VA for us. Ron Triolo is the director. Um, the Institute for Functional Restoration, sorry Hunter, you don't have a logo, I just had to write that down, is led by Hunter Peckham and Megan Moynihan, and they're hopefully going to be a, 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 tra a clinical translation partner for many of the things that go on in the FES Center. And we have collaborators at the Cleveland Clinic as well. I told you about our new definition for FES, which is expanded. We also, our thrusts are, are broadened and some of them are new. We have new technologies. Uh, the network neuroprosthesis is a new system for implementing FES systems, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. We have electrical block technology now, which is becoming much more widely used. Um, we have intercortical brain-computer interface work. We do neural modeling in the brain, in the spinal cord, in peripheral nerves. Um, we have a new technique for autonomic uh, recording from autonomic nerves. I saw Dominic Duran here. So there's many new the technologies keep coming to the fore, and that gives us the opportunity then to apply these ultimately. Oops. Our funding is also increasing as a group. Now we have more <laughs> investigators, so that helps. But still, you know, most of the work that we do is by investigator initiated and funded projects. The center helps to provide that, that environment that allows, that allows everyone to be successful. But Congratulations to all the investigators. This is uh, uh, an all-time high for the FES Center. All that adds up to um, success. The FES Center um, submitted a proposal last winter. It was reviewed early in, in the spring. We had a site visit in August, and now we're funded again for another five years. So that, that new funding starts uh, next year and goes through 2022. So that's a you know, a, a, really a great reflection on all the work that, that you do, and it's, it's really a great thing. That makes, I believe, 25 years um, total uh, funding for the FES Center. So congratulations to all of you. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about our research portfolio and, and you know, what, what we're doing and where we intend to go. Whoops, that was fast. This is my attempt to show the, the, the various kinds of research that are done in the FES Center. So in the center here, sort of holding everything together is technology. And I talked about technology already. We have modeling technology. We have um, neural interface technology. We have neural device technology. Um, we do a lot of things in these areas. We have a lot of expertise also in surgical planning of various kinds, where to place electrodes, how to, how to do the surgeries. We do preclinical testing, and we especially do something that we're well known for is first-in-man feasibility testing. It's a fairly uh, um, ubiquitous uh, skill in the FVS Center. So these are, these are the things that we, we all hold in common. This is like the toolkit that we can 
pull out and, and use in different ways. And they're used in different ways. So movement restoration here has been our, our main application for many years and, and, and remains a, a, you know, a very large uh, contributor to the center. This involves stimulation for hand and arm function, for respiratory pacing and for cough in people who have spinal cord injury, gait assistance in stroke, uh, a bunch of combined functions. So someone has a spinal cord injury with profound paralysis, they have many functions that need to be restored, not just one at a time. And we do a lot of work with user interfaces. How does the person control the, their systems uh, naturally? But uh, the, other, the other kind of well-established activity that we've had is, is what we've now called brain health. And this includes stroke rehabilitation, it includes Parkinson's disease and movement disorders. Uh, we've been doing brain computer interfacing for a few years now. But we're expanding, we're, we're, going to, we're, we're purposely going to build a, a program in traumatic brain injury. Um, we've, we have now new expertise in epilepsy and we're looking to apply some of these tools to neuropsychiatry. This is a, 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 a plan for the next five years in some cases, but this is, this is where we're going. Pain mitigation, pain is, is, a, is a, the largest single application of electrical stimulation commercially. Um, it works so-so, and we're looking to make that a much more effective and more broadly used uh, technology for things like neuropathic pain, neuromuscular pain, amputation-related pain, and post-surgical pain. And finally, we've really branched out into the use of electrical stimulation for autonomic systems as well. So these are all the internal body functions, visceral functions that you don't normally think about. They're all you know, controlled by the nervous system and we have theoretically at least the ability to intervene here. So we have a long established activity in bladder function. We're working on bowel function now. Sleep disorders, asthma, CPOD, cardiac arrhythmias, hypertension, appetite, and autonomic dysreflexia is something that happens in people with uh, spinal cord injury, which is life-threatening. These are just some, uh, you know, some, some, some of the applications that we make of, of electrical stimulation. So these five thrusts will, will sort of drive the, the FES uh, research uh, agenda in the next five years. Again, what, what do we have in common? Those look like they were many different things that we're, we're using uh, FES for. We, we are really expert at characterizing the physiology of target organs. That can be a muscle that you're stimulating, a bladder, um, many, many different things. Whoops. We know how to do neuroanatomy so that we can look at, in this case, a peripheral nerve characterize it and then model it and use simulations to, to design the next generation of interfaces and stimulation patterns. Rather than trial and error, it accelerates things, can maintain safety, etc. So we do, whoops, we do a lot of modeling and simulation. Um, we've, to, to, well, I, I'll just move on. We, we've used the modeling and simulation extensively. We do preclinical testing. We do fabrication of first, the first uh, devices that we often implant. We know how to do regulatory uh, activities and get approvals. For many, many years since I've been here, we've been really great at putting together teams of scientists, engineers, and clinicians that really operate as a unit and then move things forward fast. And finally, like I said before, we do a lot of first in, in man a feasibility testing. Okay. Technology, again, I won't, I won't dwell on this again, but we do a lot of different kinds of technology, modeling, um, neural interfaces, devices, uh, integrated systems. The network neuroprosthesis is notable. Uh, this year, we, the team of Hunter Peckham, Kevin Kilgore, Brian Smith, and a big uh, clinical team and engineering team actually, after a number of years of development, implanted their first network neuroprosthesis system in the past year, and it, successfully, I should add, and they have another, another uh, surgery scheduled. 
this is a um, major accomplishment and th this kind of technology can be used in many, many different ways. So it gives us a platform on which to operate. Okay. So the, the clinical thrusts start with movement uh, restoration. And the clinical goal there is to stimulate muscles that are paralyzed and to then make the muscles contract and do some purposeful actions. It's a motor neuroprosthesis is what's that called, is what that is called. We've done applications in the upper extremity to restore hand function and arm function, shoulder function for, for many years. Um, we've done a lot of lower extremity FES. This is now done mostly in the, in the APT center, but this was started in the FES center. We've actually partnered with the a APT center on seated trunk stability. So someone with a high level injury, if they fall, uh, spinal cord injury, if they lean forward too far, they can't get back up. But we can stimulate their muscles and bring, whoop, bring them back up. That was fast. Okay. Uh, Tony DeMarco, Chris Kowalski, and their team have worked on, on pr restoring respiration of people that have diaphragm um, paralysis for, for a number of years. Tom Mortimer as well, who's here. Um, and, whoops, and that's now expanded into cough. So again, someone with a spinal cord injury having a cold or needing to clear the lungs is, is a major uh, a problem, and they, they've discovered a way of using spinal cord stimulation, whoops, spinal cord stimulation to evoke a coordinated cough. Multifunction, so this is what I, I mentioned before to restore hand movement and arm movement and bladder function and seated posture and other things all at the same time, not, not just one thing at a time. And we can do that now with the network neuroprosthesis. So I noted already that, th that Hunter and Kevin and their group have implanted this uh, system in, in, in their first participant to restore reach and grasp on both hands and to provide trunk function. Um, I'm working on a system to restore arm and hand function in people with higher level injuries. We've uh, actually implanted some one with, not with this system, but with a simpler system. The first implanted lower extremity FES system for stroke has been in, 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 in implemented within the last year or two, and it, it provides assistance to people that have hemiplegia and have weakness on one side. And as I said, the diaphragm pacing and cough have major um, applications, both the spinal cord injury and into some other disorders like ALS. Oops, I think I skipped one, yeah. Pain mitigation. So. That really tells it all, doesn't it? Th but the, I think uh, Kevin Kilgore came up with this figure, but it, I feel pain every time I see it. Um, it's the most common reason, pain is the most common reason for seeking medical care. It's a huge uh, 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 problem in society. It's a huge market, $60 billion or more. And there's a need for enhancements. Um, as I s show down here, Tom Mortimer and his, his colleague Sheely basically invented spinal cord stimulation a while ago. And it, it was a, it's been a breakthrough. It's, it's sustained the test of time, it's still used. Um, but it, it's, it's about 50% of people that use it get about 50% um, relief. So there's room for improvement and we're hoping we can work on that. Um, electrical stimulation has a lot of advantages over other treatments like drugs. Um, it can be dosed continuously. You can turn it up, you can turn it down. Um, it's not addictive. It, it, it can be very rapid in its, in its uh, action. Okay, so we have a number of, pro of, of uh, uh, projects that are already working on this. We use computational modeling. Um, I think if I go to the next slide. I can show you these in more detail. So um, John Che and Rich Wilson and their team have worked with a, uh, over many years and most recently with a company called SPR Therapeutics to 
develop a new treatment for shoulder pain in people primarily with hemiplegia due to stroke but with other reasons as well. And it basically uses neuromodulation in, in shoulder muscles, stimulation in the shoulder muscles to relieve pain. And as you can see, they just got clearance from the FDA at the end of July. So that's also a, uh, you know, a long-term uh, commitment on their part to bring that to the market. Kevin Kilgore and Neloy Badra and their team have developed electrical conduction block to block pain that amputees have from their stumps. And so um, this has been transferred to a company called Neuros Medical, which is outside of Cleveland here, just outside. They're undergoing, it's undergoing a, a, a clinical trial right now. And it works not by activating anything, but by blocking signals in the nerves. And finally, um, we do a lot of computational mod modeling. Scott Lemke and, and Cameron McIntyre have, and Kevin, I guess, have worked a lot to develop uh, models of, of the spinal cord and when you stimulate in a certain way, what is actually getting activated and optimizing that and optimizing the patterns as well. Okay. Brain health is our next uh, thrust and there are many different aspects. This is kind of a, a sprawling uh, thrust but they all have the brain in, 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 in the center. So these are things like stroke and traumatic brain injury, epilepsy, Parkinson's disease. We believe some psychiatric conditions can be mitigated by electrical stimulation in appropriate places and appropriate ways in the brain. So Cameron and his group do a lot of uh, brain modeling. Um, we work with surgeons that do deep brain stimulation and Cameron works in this as well. This is a, a recording from human brain in our brain con computer interface project. We work in Parkinson's disease and depression, epilepsy, uh, stroke rehabilitation. So th this is a, a system from Jamie Knudsen. And I don't know, is this Michael Fu's uh, virtual reality? So this is a partnership of, of, of two of our investigators. Basically, someone who has hemiplegia due to stroke you, you have them do these bilateral tasks. You record what they do with their unimpaired hand. You stimulate the muscles to do the same thing on the opposite hand, and it, it significantly enhances the rehabilitation. And like I said, we're doing brain-computer interfaces. This is my own work with, uh, with Baloo Ajiboy. Okay, and finally, autonomic systems. So this is a new frontier, really, in, in electrical stimulation technologies. The autonomic nervous system controls a vast majority of the internal organs in the body in kind of a push-pull way and has impacts on many things, things that you wouldn't even think about. It, it was, I, it's been eye-opening to me. And so there are many, many applications to stimulate the, the, or block in the autonomic nervous system. You know, pelvic health, which is an area that we that Ken Gustafson and and uh, Dennis Bourbeau are already working. Um, autonomic dysreflexia, I, I mentioned before, sleep disorders, but pulmonary care, hypertension, you know, cardiac arrhythmias, and you know, post-stroke uh, aspiration uh, prevention. And I, I won't go through these again, but we have a number of, of investigators, many of them new since, since five years ago in, in the FES Center, anyway, who are developing applications of FES for many of these applications. Okay. Okay, so it's an FES renaissance. And so we, we have people working all over the place on different things, and they're all busy. And there's all this new knowledge that's, that's emerging and all these new techniques. So you, uh, it, it's really a great time to be in FES research. Okay. Accomplishments. So first of all, each one of you has one of these booklets. It's called our Report to the Community. And it will elaborate way beyond what I'm going to talk about today. So there's, some, there's homework. Okay, but this really describes the work that we've done in the past year or two to um, promote the, the, the applications of FES. 
We have many, many uh, congratulations to give. I'm not going to dwell on them uh, uh, for too long, but I, I do want to point some things out. We have people who have been awarded to, given you know, Cameron, who just walked out, <laughs> is uh, American Institute of Medical and Biological Engineering. Um, we have, you know, Ron Reekers was given a Crane's Business uh, Healthcare Heroes Award. We have a number of people, you know, John Che got FDA approval. Um, Tina Vrabeck uh, successfully defended her PhD. Um, we have people who have won awards at meetings. Um, Megan and Hunter received approval for the expedited uh, um, pathway program from the FDA, which hopefully will move their, their products along towards the market. Um, many, there, you can read about these in more detail in the book. Um, Kevin Kilgore has, has uh, done something that's, that's extremely unique and interesting. He won a contest over at Metro Health Medical Center. It was sort of like out of, you know, out of the box ideas for improving the way they do things. And he was one of the winners. And what he's proposed to do is called Metro House, which is literally building a house next to Metro so that people who are coming for FES treatments and other treatments, I guess, and need a place to stay, they can stay in a place that's next to the hospital has the appropriate kind of, of care for them, and they can stay for longer periods of time. So it's, it's really uh, interesting. Um, both Ron Reekers and Ali Mashara received uh, awards of recognition from the Undersecretary of, of the VA. Many people got new awards, research awards. So the, the, this is funding for, for research. Kevin Kilgore, Kingman Stroll, Dennis Borbeau, Neloy Badra, Mike Fu, Nathan Mikowski, Greg Nemunitis, Fu and Jamie Knutson again, and Rich Wilson all have received recent funding awards from national, uh, uh, from federal agencies or from foundations. Yes. <laughs> and so, some of these are the, are the older guys, but there's a lot of young people here, which is really great. So this just is a detail of our overall funding, which includes ongoing uh, projects and, and new projects as well. Um, again, $18 million directed towards FES-related goals is, is really impressive, uh, and you know, congratulations to all of you on that. Just to give you an idea of where that stands in recent history, um, there have been a few ups and downs, but we're definitely on the up right now, and we have been for the last few years. So money's not everything, but uh, we, we wouldn't be here if we didn't have the funding to continue our work. So keep at it. A little bit on outreach. So the FES Center does a lot of outreach to the community in many different ways. Again, a lot of this is described in the, in the, um, the report to the community. But for example, there was a, a, a convention of healthcare journalists that were in town this past summer, and we participated in a, in a day over at Metro Health Medical Center where we presented what we were doing. We brought in a number of our participants. These journalists spoke to the investigators, they spoke to the participants, and it's resulted in a number of uh, of really high visibility, high impact, uh, you know, media publications. So that, that was a, a very well, uh, well done thing. Um, we host activities. We have, we have the ability to host conferences. You'll see that in a minute. But for example, we had a, we had a big uh, group for our BrainGate project. We hosted the, the annual summit here in town. Craig Nielsen Foundation visited. The Halyard Health visited. We had people from the VA Tech Transfer Office visit. And the, the, the staff uh, um, coordinated those activities. We have all kinds of people come through our labs, over, especially over at the VA that we host. Um, you know, people from some of the um, advocacy groups, the Disabled American Veterans, people from Congress, Representative Bill Johnson came. We had a big group of congressional um, aides come at one point. We, but we also have sort of high school career day shadowing events and and Great Lakes Science Center high school events and 
um, many, many other similar activities that we, we host regularly. We do outreach into the community. Um, Cheryl Dudek and her, her staff really are essential part of the um, PVA, the Buckeye PVA wheelchair games that are held every year. We have a big turnout to, to help with that. Um, but we participate in many other sort of science for the, for the, for the um, lay public events as well. And like I said, we, we, we go to a number of different uh, um, scientific conferences and we exhibit. So we have a booth there, we meet and talk to people that are interested in from, from potential participants to people that have spinal cord injuries or stroke to other investigators. We describe the work we do and hopefully make contact. So we go to, we go to uh, clinical meetings, we go to scientific meetings, we go to business meetings. Okay. We have a really prominent um, seminar series called the, the um, Neuroprosthesis Seminar Series and we have great speakers. We try to bring in a combination of like-minded people and people that are sort of on the edge of what we would consider relevant to sort of spread, you know, to be, to be diverse in that. So we, we have mostly external people. You know, David Rankins Meyer is really a mechanical engineer who does rehabilitation devices. Uh, Polina Anakiva is a basic material scientist who's developing these crazy new electrodes to do stimulation and recording. We have some local people. We had Jerry Silver from the neurosciences department. Elias Vese from, from the VA, pain uh, service. So we've had, we've had a really great uh, group of people every year. We, have an, uh, we've, we start our series pretty soon. Oh, yes, next Friday. Um, so th this is an, a way in which we can sort of bring in new ideas and new viewpoints from around the country and we can also sort of strut our stuff to these folks. And finally, if you don't get enough out of the, the report to the community, you can go to our webpage, fvscenter.org. There's a lot of information on there about the work we do. There's videos for most of the investigators if you want to understand what, what goes on in, their, in people's labs. Um, you know, someone who wants to join a study, et cetera. There's a lot of information there. Okay. I still have, good a few minutes and I want to talk a little bit about the future and it, I think there's three lanes here and they're wide open alright so that's that's the that's the message that I want you to take home I'll say it a few times so these are the good old days you know I, things really almost uh, have, have aligned perfectly so we have technology advances we have new FES technologies and we have a lot of new applications so there's a huge number of opportunities there. Well, there, there's many growing uh, application areas. Like I said, the FES Center thrusts reflect this now. And, you know, there, there, again, huge opportunities in the research realm. In the clinical realm, those applications of electrical stimulation are growing also pretty rapidly. And there's much more clinical acceptance of electrical stimulation as an intervention than, for example, when I started in this area. There are federal funding initiatives that are really aligned to, the, to these thrusts and the work that we all do. I list some of them, the Brain Initiative, Spark is for, and Electrics actually, are both for autonomic applications. Um, Spark is from NIH and Electrics is from DARPA. There's a major industrial interest Companies um, are, there's a, a lot of companies now in, in the market of electrical stimulation devices. There's a lot of competition, which is a good thing for us because people are looking to innovate and, and sort of outdo their, their competitors. And the, the sort of the forecast is really fantastic. Annual growth of 14.4%, annual growth of 14.4% is expected until at least 2020 for a $7 billion total market. So that's really expanding rapidly. So there are a huge number of, of opportunities here. 
you know, everything's kind of aligned and, you know, it's, it, we have to find ways to take advantage of this. So, I'm challenging all of you, that's a big hand there, to take on grand challenges, to do, to do big things with these opportunities. You know, we really are at a, at a, at this unique point where new technologies and interest and funding is all sort of aligned. So these are my suggestions now. Work on problems that are of high priority to society. Take a step back and say, well, I've always worked on this, but actually, you know, maybe I need to work on that because it's a more pressing societal problem. Think about that. Better work on things that allow us to better understand the mechanisms of complex neurological disorders. You know, th there's a tendency, especially in companies, to do simple things that don't always work out. Many clinical trials fail because ultimately they didn't understand the mechanism of the disorder or of the intervention. So this is important. This is a basic science uh, a goal. So devise disruptive, game-changing uh, uh, technologies that resolve these problems. You know, we've always used this kind of electrode. We've always done this kind of stimulation. It's time to think a little bit. And, and this happens already. No, I'm, I'm not trying, I don't want to offend anybody. We're doing this already. But I'm urging people to look even a little broader because of the opportunities. Work to de-risk your innovations. So if you want to get this to out into the clinical world, it's almost certainly going to go through a commercial partner. And they want to have some confidence that it's going to work. So as you move it along, you need, to, you need to stick with it maybe longer than you'd like and get it to a point where a company will say, okay, that's, that's adequately uh, de-risked so that you know, we, we can do an investment. Ultimately, we want to improve the, the clinical standards of care. I mean, if, if we develop a device that works great and nobody ever adopts it or nobody ever pays for it, then we really haven't accomplished that much. So you, you, again, this is maybe for our clinical partners here to, to work to move this out into a, a sort of a standard of care, not some, some futuristic strange thing. Okay. So there are a lot of things that could be grand challenges. And the first thing, what it says basically is like, I'm not going to tell you what you think the grand challenges are. I want you to step back and think about what are, my grand, what are the grand challenges in the little world in which I work, and maybe in a bigger world in which you don't currently work. The FVS Center it, it is, does ongoing strategic planning. So if you think the next greatest thing is X, Come and talk to us, and we'll see if we can help you. you know, we, we, we are committed to investing in some of these big picture, big challenges. I want to give some examples just to stir the pot a little bit about what I think the big challenges are. And some of them are going to sound very familiar, and some of them might not. So we need to make our technologies widely available. You know, when we develop new things, they need to get out into the world. If we hold on to them just for ourselves, then again, we're, we're defeating the purpose of our, of our big mission. So there's a lot of things here. Um, there's, there's, you know, as, as at least several of you know very well, there's sort of cost and safety and regulatory challenges. Maybe make it easier to plan interventions by doing modeling. Um, Neural interfaces that are durable. This is especially true in the brain. How do we, how do we make them last you know, decades and not months? Um, anyway, develop technologies that overcome these challenges and can get out into the world. Make stimulation-based interventions the standard approach rather than the approach of last resort at least some of the time. I mean, we know that, some, that in some of these cases, electrical stimulation is a great intervention, but it's often left as the last resort. After 
you know, s some other kinds of therapy, drug therapy, surgeries of other kinds, and all these things fail. Well, let's try electrical stimulation. We have nothing to lose. There are many applications where I think it should be the, the, the default treatment. Paralysis. So I'm going to go through some of the areas that we work. Mitigate all of these things, or at least many of these things at the same time. I know there's work going on there, but what about sensation? What about autonomic dysreflexia? These are big challenges in, in, in paralysis that I, I'm not sure the last two that we're doing a lot to mitigate. They're tough. Oops. Autonomic disorders. So it's been termed bioelectric medicine or electroceuticals. So this is using electrical stimulation in ways that drugs have typically been used. And it's really kind of a new area. I mean, it's really in its infancy, and it's pretty crude. You know, 90% of it is put an electrode on the vagus nerve and stimulate it. And it does, some, it does lots of things, you know, but you need to be a little more selective. But, you know, overcome, there's some challenges there. The neurons are small. They don't have myelination in many cases. And so we need to, we need to work on interfaces that will work with that. And I know there's work going on. We need to understand the neural control mechanisms of the autonomic nervous system way better than we do, okay? Psychi psychiatric disorders. I don't think we know very much at all about those mechanisms. I mean, there be deep brain stimulation is being used with some success in some disorders, but it's just a shot in the dark almost, and we need to understand those mechanisms. Um, we need to maybe find out biomarkers, like do recordings that say, Someone is in a bipolar state. They're, they're depressed today so that you can intervene in a, in, a, in, a, in a more appropriate way. Pain. I said this before. It, 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 spinal cord stimulation for pain is, is, is widely used, but there's improvements that need to be made. And there, there's people I know working on this. But it, it has, there, there's a huge market here. And pain in general, you know, the, the use of electrical block and uh, other technologies. Traumatic brain injuries. So this is extremely challenging um, disorder. It's very diffuse damage. It often includes both, uh, you know, cognitive and psychological and movement de deficits. It's also a big challenge to society. It's a big problem. So this is why over the over the next five years we're going to be working to build a program in that area, you know. Where, what, what are the mechanisms that are, that are impaired here? And where and how can we intervene in some way to mitigate these symptoms? Okay, so just a little more advice and then, then we'll be done. So there are research projects that seem to go on forever and you get so close and then you sort of give up. Maybe just before you hit the, the, the mother load there. So, Things that are important, stick with. And maybe you've got to change your direction, your, the way you're looking at the problem, but, but stick with them. If you, if you find you're sort of in a little eddy current here along the shore and you're stuck, push away from the shore. Do so, you know, do, look at it differently. Do something differently. Get back out into the mainstream here. We've all accumulated this big book of tricks. See, it's an old dog learning new tricks. We all have fundamental core skills and expertise that we can use in maybe ways that we never thought about. You know, you, you sort of associate your research program maybe with a very specific topics when really you could do many different things with those, with those skills. So now might be the time for you to get out of the the crowd and jump over into that uh, completely wide open spaces where there, there's all kinds of, you know, it's a lot of fun when you're in a new field and there's a lot to be discovered. You're not, look, you're not digging around in the corners looking for some undiscovered niche. You got the whole field out in front of you. Okay, just a couple more. So this is a, the, the um, opportunity lander on Mars. I picked it because it's opportunity and that's what I want you to look at. But 
this arm and that device has all kinds of sensors and testing ability. It's because they didn't know what they were going to find when they were there. And they're flexible with, the, with these. They can, they can study a lot of different things in a lot of different places. The thing's moved like 25 miles since it landed. So, you know, recognize what your skill set is. Look back, you know, you learn things in school, you've done all kinds of research projects, you have a lot of skills that maybe you've forgotten about. Brush the rust off. The Tin Man's not gonna do yoga unless he can use his oil can. This, all right, so. <laughs> so be open to using those skills in new ways. Determine, you know, take a different look, you know, a little self-reflection. How can I best use my skills to make something happen for the, for the world, okay? And I already talked about our template. We have, a, we have a pretty good template for this. This is sort of a general, apply to almost any clinical problem template. You gotta understand the physiology, you have to understand the neuroanatomy, you have to know how to, how to activate and, and, and inactivate the, the neural system, and then you need to go through sort of the, the testing and in preclinical testing and the regulatory things, et cetera. That's one template. There's many others. I just put that up as, a, as an example. The second trick is collaboration. You can see that, well, first of all, it says, okay, you're all superheroes, but the key to success is collaboration. And so you're all superheroes, I know that. But there are so many things that we could be doing, and some of them are pretty complicated. And if we try to do them individually, it's gonna either take the rest of your career to do a little thing, or it's never gonna get done. So I urge people to collaborate in, you know, in the community, in across the country, with companies, whatever it takes to solve the problem, okay? So why? I looked up why, why, why should scientists collaborate, Google it sometimes, it's very interesting. There, there are some practicalities that I'll start, start with. People's um, impact factor goes up when they collaborate with more, the, the more authors on a paper, the higher the impact factor. I would have never guessed that. Um, but you get more publications, more imp higher impact factor, more patents, higher profile. Apparently you get reviewed better in grants. So these are the carrots for, for you know, sort of the self-interested part of yourself. But it also brings complementary skills. You know, to build a house, it takes a carpenter, an electrician, a plumber, an architect, all these people. And our work's not really different than that. You know, it, it, takes, it takes a lot of different skills. You can look at things different ways. Do you see the, the people here? It's a famous sort of optical illusion. You can either see a vase or, a, or people, you know. One little idea could turn into a big idea if you had some collaborators. So we can do things that we wouldn't able, be able to do otherwise. Somebody at a university across the country has some special technique or some special electrode or something that we don't have that would enable us then to f that would complete the picture of a, of a particular research project. I think we get to, to, the, to our impact on society uh, faster and we have an opportunity to learn when you collaborate with somebody that knows something that you don't know suddenly you become an expert on lower extremity modeling or something that you never thought you'd do in your life okay so I want to say that the FES Center is open for business we've been open for business but we're looking for collaborations and we're looking for collaborations with individuals with academic partners with institutional partners and with industrial partners. We're, we're working very hard on the last area, Andy's working very hard to develop meaningful, lasting strategic partnerships with relevant industrial partners. Okay, almost there. So I said before, I think that FES is really and truly in a, in a renaissance, we have a a broad definition of FES. We have a lot of clinical interest. There's a lot of new technologies. We have a lot of new scientific and clinical expertise in the center. Um, our research thrusts reflect that. They're broadened and we're building up a strong um, industrial outreach program. 
So the leadership of the FVS Center, I just want to tell you that we really are committed to making these things happen, but you know, we need your help, we need your feedback, we need your ongoing commitment to working together with, with the rest of the, of the center. And we need you to, to help us make the next five years even more special than, than the past few years have been. So if you're not a member, join. At least collaborate with us. Contribute to our strategic vision. Be bold with your, with your research agenda. You know, we have to keep moving forward. You know, our center was refunded, at least in part, because we evolved the center. It's a requirement, and it's something we should do anyway, but, you know, it, it's a requirement. And I say down here, so Hunter, this is, I'm, I'm going to start doing Ds instead of Ps. Discover, develop, and deploy. You know, put your, put your shoulder to the, to the lever there and climb the top. See, it's FES at the top of the mountain there. Doors wide open, so thank you. Right, let's make the next uh, few years even more special than now, so thanks.